academics, by definition, are cosmopolitans. That's not to say we're not citizens of states, uh, but university personnel have always been cosmopolitan. We, we are part of the Republic of Letters. Uh, and so you're, it's going to be very rare that you get a strong endorsement of nationalism out of any academic historian today. So, yes. That's different from patriotism. So I took a pledge to uh, uh, support the Constitution. The myths that underway the German feeling of superiority, uh, Oh, sure, but, but everybody had those. I mean, uh, Herbert Baxter Adams, at, when he founded the History Department at Johns Hopkins in 1876, uh, you know, talked about the mystic unity of the Teutonic germ of freedom transmitted from the forests of Saxony through England and on to New England where he picked it up at Amherst College. Uh, so uh, 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 the Germans were not exempt from that. Uh, we're not, we're not outstanding. Talking about the skill of leaders in pulling on that part of the culture. Sure. Uh, you, can, you can see it what Slobodan Milosevic did with the myth of the Battle of Blackbird Fields, of, uh, of the, Battle, the Battle of Kosovo. Uh, uh, to create a Serbian nationalism to upset a balance that had uh, uh, been preserved for 40 years in uh, Yugoslavia. Yes? Do you feel that the Islamization of Europe is a result of the post-war philosophies? I reject the premise of the Islamization of Europe. Uh, do, uh, do I feel that the Islamization of Europe is a result of post-war philosophies? I reject the premise of the Islamization of Europe. There are Muslims in Europe where there didn't used to be Muslims in Europe. You do not feel that England in particular and France is being Islamized? No. Uh, I don't. There, there are Muslims there, but I don't think that they're changing the center of culture or of politics. And I think that over time, they're likelier to be changed than they are to change. Well, how is it that already some Sharia laws have been adopted and are being followed? They've not been adopted any place. They've been implemented by some judges. Uh, and this is because the English system uh, authorizes judges to use some discretion, particularly in courts of equity dealing with family law. And you ignore the discretion, I think, was to them. So, well, uh, we, we, it's clear that we disagree, but uh, I don't spend a lot of time in England, but certainly in Germany, which has the largest, oldest, uh, uh, and most continuous Muslim community. Uh, most of them are Turks, actually most of them are Kurds, uh, uh, but they're from Turkey. Uh, they build mosques, uh, but I don't see German culture being Islamized. Did you say most of them are Kurds? Yeah, yeah. A lot of the Turks in Germany are Kurds. And back during the days when the PKK was uh, struggling against the uh, uh, Turkish government, there were all, all kinds of internecine assassinations in the Turkish community in Germany. So. Is it centered any place more than any other? Is it what? This, the German community? The Turkish Turkish. The Turkish community in Germany? Is it spread out? Yeah, uh, it's, it's urban. The question is, is the Turkish community in Germany uh, spread out? It's in cities, every city of any consequence. Uh, it's, it's heavier in others. A very large Turkish population in uh, Ruhr because they came in and took industrial jobs. Very large Turkish population in Berlin, 300,000. You haven't spent too much time uh, on the economics uh, disasters of the 20s and 30s uh, that I think uh, constitute a major um, catalyst in a sense to the growth of this kind of extremism that the checks and balances of what one might call middle class morality and middle class um, moderation were simply wiped out by the inflation. Well, I mean, clear, clearly, and, and Brian, I'm sure, is going into this uh, uh, in his class on, on Weimar and German Jews. Um, there were four years of repose in all of the history of the Weimar Republic, and that was after the currency had been destroyed. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, in the 
this, in this complete tumult, and beyond that, there's, there's, there's a very large literature about the rationalization of industry. This is the real uh, uh, adoption in Germany of Fordist kind of, uh, uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor became just a patron saint in Germany in the 1920s. So even if you kept a job, if you didn't have any money to lose in the inflation, even if you kept a job uh, and avoided unemployment, your terms and conditions of labor got worse because uh, it was being, uh, A, some workers were being rationalized, machines were replacing workers, and B, there was a speed up. Uh, so you had to work harder. This leads to labor strife, and uh, that led, uh, the six party system led that directly into political strife. Can you give one last question? Sure. I want to touch on a point you made in one of your points before um, in terms of the change in Europe and reflect on it in a way that I think American Jews or Jews around the world often do. Uh, you know, and that's tied into questions of forgiveness um, and really coming to grips with this past. And you know, I know many of the people that I encounter have tremendous difficulty accepting this notion that Germany or Germans in Germany can never really change. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. there was a lot of this discussion, as you know, with the reunification um, and the return of the German question and would a greater Germany or a return of some sort of greater Germany position them, yeah. not only economically, but then ultimately from their economic success, which we all see, to, you know, they've just been buying their time. And to tie this into a very you know, real issue that, that, uh, that we confront in the Jewish community, which is the um, really the, the disappearance of the survivor community, um, you know, who had such a, not just a, such a stake in never again in educating the future generations, but I think, you know, in many ways of, of carrying that banner uh, of uh, really being wary of that German beast should it arise again. Well, what I can say is that, for starters, the, the, the gist of the question is, um, you want to try? <laughs> I, I, was, I was formulating my answer. So. You, can, you can keep formulating the answer. Um, and I, I think this is an issue that, that, uh, that North American Jews, the Jews throughout the world, uh, are having difficulty coming to grips with is this pacified Germany, a peaceful Germany, a demilitarized Germany, and at the same time a strong Germany in Europe. And you know, should not only Jews, but everybody out there, uh, and again, this question of what do we learn from history, uh, should we not trust Germans um, to be in a position of power and authority? Should we be afraid uh, that they're just biding their time and now, especially since it's a new generation, and all those people who lived through the issues of, and oppression of Germany are no longer around to remind us of what that, that hell was like. Yeah. Um, 